All right, g'day everyone. Welcome back to the True Footy Podcast, episode 53. And in today's episode, I am joined by the brothers that make up footy A to Z. How are you, lads? Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks, uh, Jesse. Thanks for having us on. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time we're uh, we're trying like a three man uh, podcast over Skype, and we've we've had the inevitable snag already, where you're both sort of waiting for the other to answer, and then you both answer at the same time. But now that's all good. Uh, thanks for joining us today. One question, just to clarify: Do you guys say A to Z or A to Z? A to Z. Interesting, because I always say A to Z, but yeah, no, that's funny. Um, Terry it's asked Terry from uh, Blues Blue Abroad asked us the exact same question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh well, uh, that's funny. Um, cool, lad. So, um, I you guys must be probably one of the newer channels. In fact, probably the newest channel uh, that I've actually had on the uh, podcast so far. Um, but I'm stoked to have you on because I'm a huge fan of you guys already. Um, why don't you go ahead um, and tell maybe the audience of True Footy who might not have heard of you before, uh, what your channel's all about. Yeah. Do you want to go on, Jace? Uh, yeah, I can do it this time. I guess you did it last time. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so like you said, we're, we're pretty new. We started the channel, um, I think, just before the grand final last year. It's around September sometime. Um, a lot of inspiration for it comes from another YouTube channel called Tifo Football. Uh, I don't know if you've come across any of their videos before, but... It's a very similar kind of style to us with a lot of kind of illustrations and graphic-based videos. Um, so they're a, they're a channel that I've followed for a long time, and they do a lot of stuff around soccer and, and what they call football over on that side of the world. Um, and we just kind of wanted to do a similar thing for our game over here. So we've got kind of two branches of the sort of videos we do on the channel. Um, one is what we call our AFL Explain videos, which is just kind of like breaking down the game into, into segments and and looking at things in like a little bit more detail than, than what the average footy fan normally would. Um, and then we've got another segment where we generally like or another sort of style of video where we, we pick a topic um, and have a bit of a more sort of in-depth look at it. So stuff like um, we've done videos on, you know, the ownership structure of AFL clubs and uh, comparisons between the Gold Coast and GWS and that kind of stuff on there as well. Yes, I, I've seen those videos and they're, they're top-notch work. Like, I've, I like how you guys have clearly sort of identified um, a niche in this space. And uh, admittedly, like, it's a pretty, like, AFL YouTube is kind of still in its infancy. So, there's plenty of niches to go around. But you guys have really picked on, like, the informative um, and well-researched aspect of YouTube, which at the moment no one's really doing. Can I ask who, was it both of you who kind of at the same time were both like, yes, let's do it? Or like, was one per one of you more into it than the other? Because it's, it's sometimes, it's usually one person's idea and then the other one hops on. But are, would you say you guys are both sort of like like-minded on it? Yeah. Well, it was kind of like one day Andreas, um, he's like, we're not living together anymore, but at the time we were, um, and he was like, come into my room and look at this video, um. And it was one of Tifo Football's videos, like, how sick is this? Um, he's like, wouldn't it be crazy if there was one for AFL? Um, and that was kind of like the first time I'd been put into the fold. I don't know how much he'd been thinking of it before <laughs> that. Um, A little bit. And, yeah, it was kind of one of those things that we just said would be cool to do for ages. Um, I think I would have been in, like, still year 10 or 11 at the time. Um, and Andreas would have been a couple of years into uni. And eventually it kind of just, we were like, let's start working on some stuff. And Andreas had a few skip scripts on the back burner. Like I think that GWS Gold Coast video um, was like kind of the ideation video. It's like, we've been working on that since the start. Wow, um, so it was yeah. really cool when that finally came out. Uh, but I guess kind of towards the end of last year, uh, we were like, let's just do this. I started studying media at uni, um, so it was kind of just naturally like I wanted to start making content anyway, just because that's what they encourage. Um, and then it just went from there, and now we kind of just do it on the go, and it's where we are. How long ago was that process? Oh, sorry, Andres, you go. I was going to say I think about two years went by between when I started working on that first script and when we actually started making videos, it was like something that just kind of sat there for a while. Cause we got, I went away 
for six months. We both got really busy with uni. Um, and then, yeah, kind of came back to it. And I think Zach's, like Zach was saying, his degree and him, like, getting a lot of the skills that then helped us to actually physically be able to make videos then kind of kicked it off properly. Yeah, that's cool. So, um, that's right. So, you guys, what what actually are your backgrounds before going into this? Zach, I'm a, uh, I believe you, um, I think you said it on Terry's channel that you did uh, media. Is that is that what you're studying right now? Yeah, so I'm a media communications student, um, just in my second year, uh, and then my major is kind of like journalism and social media and stuff. Yeah, and what about you, Andreas? Yeah, um, I'm just uh, just started a master's, so I'm doing a master's in environmental engineering. Um, my undergrad majored in physics, so wow. Zach skill Zach skill set is definitely a lot more helpful than mine is uh, when it comes <laughs> to this kind of stuff. But I think I like always have had a passion for that kind of research side of things. Um, and, you know, like the, the numbers behind footy kind of come into it from that side of things, I guess, as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it is a far leap from, you know, making YouTube videos on footy. But it's it's clear that you both actually, I would say, it seems like you both have a natural skill for it. You're both obviously intelligent, very articulate. So I think you're kind of well made for it. But Andreas as well, like I want to ask, when, uh, when you guys started the channel, be- because you're doing such a, I won't say niche degree, but it's kind of like a degree that um, most people, I'd contrast it to someone like myself who did like commerce and I was like, I'm just doing this degree because I don't really know what I'm doing, whereas yours is a little bit more focused. What's sort of like your goal with the channel? Is it, is it like a, is it, is it something you want to sort of make a career of? And this is a question sort of to both of you. Um, is this something you really want to um, push or is it kind of just a hobby? Where, where does it sit for you? Um, it's a good question. It's not really something we've discussed. No, I like. I, I haven't even asked this him this stuff yet. Though. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's what I'm here I for. I think <laughs> our, our our immediate yeah, our immediate goal is just to get the, the the channel monetized. Like that's what we've been working towards. Um, obviously, YouTube has you know certain thresholds you have to reach and certain criteria, which I think is good. Like the reasons behind why they brought that stuff in a few years ago, I think was sound, but. Um, that's kind of been our, our goal that we've just had, uh, at the top. And then we haven't really discussed anything beyond that. Um, but yeah, I guess like, I don't think it would ever be something that I would do full time, but it's a hobby that I do really enjoy. Um, and I think it also helps that there's two of us from that end as well. So we can kind of, you know, if one of us is a little bit busier, the other one can pick up the slack. Yeah, that's cool. Um, uh, that's that's an, another thing I sort of want to ask is how the sort of working dynamic goes with you two. Um, is it fairly like you you sort of, hmm, it's an awkward question, like do you split the work fairly equally? Because, um, you know, some channels, you know, it's evident that one person's more into it than the other. H- how does the dynamic go? How do you split the work and um, what's it like working together generally? Uh, it's a lot of fun working together. Um, like I said, Andreas and I aren't living together anymore. And I think since we started the channel, we probably talk more and um, see each other like more and stuff since he moved out and stuff. So it's been really good for keeping us together that way. Yeah, definitely. In terms of how we split up the work, it's like uh, pretty 50 50, I'd say. Like we both work on scripts and write and stuff. Um, and then there's kind of like the two sides to the production is the art of the players um, and like actually producing the video. Um, so we do like a little bit of both, but mostly I do the art and Andreas produces the videos. Yeah, that's interesting because your, your videos, like they must be out of anyone I've seen in this niche, the most like intensive in terms of like to, cre- to create with all those animations and stuff like that. How long does it actually take you guys to put together a single video? Because I can imagine it w- I would not have the patience for it. But it, it they're amazing videos. Yeah. <laughs> Our record is like our record is like the grand final preview. Um, I think the weekend before the grand final, Andreas just came to me and was like, "Let's just make a preview. Let's do it. Like, let's go all." We out. had two videos on the channel at that point as well. Yeah, so we had yeah. the two our first two videos, and that's when I think we messaged you on the when we had ready to release on the Wednesday. Um, we well, like, let's just you know, right, try and ride the momentum, whatever, thinking, oh, we'll post this grand final preview and feed a million subscribers overnight and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so uh, I, the record, I guess, what I'm getting to would be from like that weekend to releasing on the Friday night, I think, before the grand yeah. final. Um, wow. Well, which is like just under a week. And um, that was like <laughs> we try and do a lot higher standard now as well and everything. We've definitely gotten a lot better as we go on. Um, because we don't actually have any background in like producing and making graphic art and stuff or anything. Uh, so that's stuff that we're learning along the way. But generally speaking, it would be like a week and a half, I would say, um, from start to finish if we just work solidly. And we could do it in a week if it was like all we did. Um, but, you know, like. Yeah, not realistic. Pretty much. I yeah. <laughs> For sure, for sure. Yeah, I it's think interesting it's that. Um, Sorry, go on. <laughs> we're going to keep doing this all time. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think before that grand final preview video, I stayed up until 3 a.m. the night before wow. to try and get wow. it finished. On I the remember when you guys. Yeah, I remember when you guys sent that to me, um, or Zach sent it to me, I think. Um, well, I presume it was Zach, because for a while there, I. Um, like, I was watching your videos and I actually didn't know that you had two different people voicing them over. Because I thought you sounded really similar, which sounds really stupid now because now that I'm a little bit familiar with both of you and I've seen who you are in person, like I can totally tell the difference in your voice now. But at the time, I didn't realize that. But I remember when you sent me um, the the link and uh, I put it in my live stream like um, yeah, that's for, right. for the grand final. Really and, uh, oh, no problem. No problem. My pleasure. It was really good. And I wouldn't have done it if I didn't rate it, which was, yeah, my point. Like I get sent videos like or, or I get messages you know, quite often from people who sort of want me to look at their channel. And I'd say I do it half the time because I can't possibly have the time to do it to everyone. But I remember watching your guys' video and I was like, holy shit, like <laughs> these guys are actually top notch already. So yeah, no, I was, I was happy to do, do it. it it's it's pretty cool how you guys, in a way, actually you, you've kind of done it similar to True Footy. You kind of almost started at the worst time of possible um, to start an AFL channel. And there's a few people... That relates to, so I started mine in the off season. You guys started it, um, well, I'm not sure when your exact first video was, but it was like, like you said, it was like your third video was the grand final preview. And then there's been like no football since, but um, it's a massive credit to get um, to like 600 odd. Uh, I think the last time I looked was at 600 odd subscribers. Um, what? How are you guys going with the whole, you know, obviously there's no football on at the moment. How are you guys going with that void in terms of content? Like, what what's um what do you guys got on the horizon for you? What's the plan? It's not the biggest issue for us. Um, I think we've had one video that we wanted to release that we've now put on the back burner um, mm -hmm. until some footy starts again because it's something that's kind of a bit more topical and relevant to the season. Um, but otherwise, it's like like we were saying, we've got so much backlog of stuff we can draw from like we've, we've made a few sort of historical videos and there's 150 years worth of footy history out there that we can we can look up um and we've yeah we've just kind of been talking about stuff that we can look at sort of in recent history and, and maybe do a bit sort of more analysis on that so we've got a series we're going to start soon that we're pretty excited about um a script that zach's just finishing up writing at the moment um which is going to be looking at sort of really iconic tactics of the game um, as they apply to like different teams and kind of the legacies that those tactics have left behind. Um, and we'll keep sort of writing more kind of historical stuff, I think, until we get some actual footy. I like it, yeah. I think we've been, we're probably more fortunate than a lot of other channels, um, like yourself especially, that um, I think we're lucky we don't have to rely on the season um, kind of as the framework of our content like it certainly helps um, and it's fun to do like current and topical things but um, yeah like Andrea said we're pretty lucky that we have lots of other stuff to, to talk about. Yeah I mean you could say it's lucky but I'd say it's just probably the product of a very smart strategy you guys have got videos that um, they call it evergreen content where uh, it's going to succeed over time whereas you know my tip my footy tips videos that I do once a week um, they do well obviously for the for the week and then they're done like there's nothing even all my podcasts basically um, but that's just the nature of the beast really in terms um, of like um, planning for the future and stuff I'm curious as to where you see it going in terms of like obviously at the moment you, you guys animate all your videos do you, is there a plan for you to sort of uh, branch out a little bit and get in front of the camera as well because um, obviously the animations are sick, but like I meant to supplement that 
because you guys have technically haven't made your on-screen debut on your own channel yet. It's only been on other channels, right? Uh, yeah. th this is our second appearance on screen and <laughs> neither yeah. has been on that channel. Um, yeah, I think it's something we'd love to do. I think we're kind of holding off for 1K. Um, just in the kind of the school of thought that the, the channel isn't necessarily about us, it's about footy. Mm -hmm. um, and while we'd love to still have, you know, and um, if we end up with a good solid fan base, which is really exciting to kind of see start to build um, when you see name, names come back and stuff. But it would be nice for them to have kind of a personal attachment to us and the channel as well. Uh, so I think if we don't before 1K, we'll definitely jump in front of the camera um, and just at the very least say thank you to everyone. Um, but I don't know. It's just like... The ethos of the channel is just celebrating footy and everything that makes footy so great. So, mm -hmm. I like it. I like it. Um, so you guys actually haven't revealed what team you support on your channel, have you? No, no we haven't. <laughs> Do you mind if we get into a little bit of talk about the club that you support today? Uh, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. All right, sweet. So um, you guys... Uh, I knew of this at the time because I think you told me when you sent me the preview for the grand final, uh, but you're actually big Richmond supporters. So uh, how, how does that actually, how did that start off with that? Um, is it a family thing? Yeah, it's a big time family thing. Yeah, our dad, our dad's the one that dragged us into it. Um, he grew up, he grew up in kind of Melbourne's inner suburbs in sort of the, the 70s and 80s at a time when, when Richmond was, you know, the club to support. Um, so he kind of adopted the Tigers as his team. His parents were my, both migrated here, so they didn't really have uh, a vested interest before that. So he adopted the Tigers, I think mostly because everyone at school. Yeah, I think, his, I think his older cousins um, supported Richmond and they kind of roped him in as well a bit. I feel like that was bad timing. <laughs> it was good timing <laughs> like, for you. Or, yeah, okay, yeah, I suppose. I just everything after about nineteen eighty two until twenty seventeen must have been. He enough. had a great childhood. Um, <laughs> fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. That was us the stories and everything. Um, but... Yeah. But yeah, definitely well, he... a lull. Yeah, definitely a lull. Well, I was gonna say he liked you and I think it's just a thing about the Richmond Footy Club is that you've kind of seen it all, like through the obviously the seventies and eighties period. Um, and then everything after that. And then, Andreas, you're a bit older. What is actually the age gap between you two? Four years. Four years. Four years, okay. So, Andreas, you'd probably have a slightly better memory of what it was like under the sort of Danny Frawley um, and Terry Wallace era. Um, were you a bit young for that, Zach? Yeah, Terry Wallace is as early as I go. Right, okay. So, what was that like? Um, I guess this is more directed a little bit to Andreas in terms of like, what was it like being a Richmond fan during that early 2000s period to, or even to the, like up until about well, pre-Hardwick, really? Yeah, I have um, very, very vague memories of 2001, uh, which is the year we, we made, actually made the prelim. Yeah, we lost to right. Brisbane. We went to the Gabba. We went up to the Gabba and lost to Brisbane, who then proceeded to win the next three grand finals in a row after that. <laughs> um, but I remember, I remember being at, um, I think it was... Uh, it was a game against Essendon and a game against Carlton. I think Essendon was the the eliminate, sorry, the qualifying final, which we lost. We then won the semi final against Carlton. Went up to Brisbane. Um, that was great. Like very vague memories of those games, but remember them being quite fun. And then obviously everything just went downhill from there. Um, I also have memories of I think there was a game at Eddie Had Stadium, which was would have been maybe even Colonial Stadium back then. Um, where Geelong beat us by almost 100 points, and I think I cried the whole way home in the car. <laughs> uh, I was quite a young kid. Paul Chapman kicked like five goals or something like that. Ouch. Um, and you just cop it at school as well. I think it, oh, yeah. it kind of helped a little bit that, that um, one of my best friends when I was growing up as a kid was also a Richmond supporter. So we kind of had each other to lean on a little bit. Uh, oh, that's that's cool from that perspective, yeah. Safety in numbers. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, the whole Danny Frawley, Terry Wallace, like that that whole era I think is kind of blended into to one in my head. Yeah, yeah fair enough. 
Yeah. What about you, Zach? What are your sort of earliest memories of that period? Like, were you – like, pretty hard. We did it feel like a long stretch. I'm trying to – I can't really gauge exactly with, like, the age there, but, like, does it feel like you were a long-suffering fan? Um, yeah. It's like – I can't really pinpoint specific moments, like a game or anything, but I just, like – have memories of growing up being at the footy and just like not enjoying being there because like we're sitting in the Richmond members just surrounded by a bunch of just angry upset people I'm just a little kid like I don't really grasp like the bigger concept of um, what the football club means to everyone yet but I just like I was that classic little kid that was just like this is just a terrible time can we go home now like kind of stuff and um and Andreas and dad like sometimes they conceded because if we were just getting pumped which was a lot of the time but um they would often just make me stay and just like I think I'm grateful that like now I like I can say like I lived through all that and stuff but at the time it was like I just didn't know what it was like to even have a team that was winning it was strange it was like just growing up in this period Mm. where um like there's just so morbid and stuff. Like you go to a game and no one's happy, and uh, it's just it was weird. Um, but then, like I, I remember, I think like my earliest like solid Richmond memory, I think, is uh, a game against Geelong as well, where it was pouring wet and it was Trent Cotchin's debut, um, and I think he kicked a couple of goals and you know impressed and. You know, for me, like a fresh face at the club and stuff, I was just like, oh my God, I love this guy, like straight away. And he's been my favorite player ever since that game and stuff. Um, so it was, it's been nice that that's kind of my earliest moment I can pinpoint. And then from there, it's slowly been going upwards, I think, kind of since Koch came to the club and then became captain. And then not that it's all on him, I think, like he gets attributed a lot of it, but. I know that's the closest I can get to explaining what it's like. Yeah, fair enough. I think you've kind of, I think it's good that you had that sort of um, almost that rite of passage where you've you've seen some dark days. Even even myself uh, as an Eagles fan, who are a relatively successful club, particularly now, I've at least gone through that dark day. I've seen a wooden spoon. But Andreas, like for you, how were, how did you? keep up the passion for Richmond or, or did that drop off a little bit? Um, like for me, I remember almost getting more passionate about the Eagles when they were terrible because I was really invested in a rebuild. But like during those dark days, like did, did your your passion ever waver? <laughs> um, I mean, I wouldn't say it, it wavered. Definitely not once I got older as well. I think the thing that kept me going was just a, a love for footy in general. Um, I like I played so much footy as a kid as well um, so that and that's you know also where a lot of the, the input from our videos come is because both of us have played a lot of footy as well but um, you know you play footy all the time you need to have an AFL club you support and for me it was it was the Tigers I remember dad co- coming to us one day actually and just being like boys if you want to pick a different team to support I won't be mad he gave wow. us an out um but but he said you can pick a different team but i'm not taking you to the footy <laughs> yeah that was his, that was his condition <laughs> the like, i won't be mad at you if you want to change teams you that's don't. a fair deal <laughs> but there's there was a day um which dad loves to remind me of whenever he gets the chance to every i think i would have been yeah i would have been maybe like six or seven years old uh it was a richmond carlton game at the MCG, and it was Stephen Silvani's 300th game. Uh, and I, like back then, was a big fan of Stephen Silvani, of course, uh, and just decided that for that day I was going to be a Carlton supporter. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, and then I'm sitting there, you know, in the Richmond members wearing a Richmond jumper, and I just decided <laughs> to start start cheering for Carlton for the day. <laughs> That's funny. I have a similar story to that, actually. Um, I think, I don't know if maybe it's something all kids do, but um, being in uh, a very staunchly West Coast household, my dad was really passionate West Coast. Everyone I, like, I'm like i related to is an Eagles fan. Um, but 
I remember for one, I don't know, I was just being a little bratty or nine-year-old, 10-year-old. Uh, it was 2004 and I switched to Essendon for the week that, remember that game where James Hurd snaps that goal to win the game and he hugs the guy in the crowd? Yeah. For, what, for whatever reason, like before that game, I became an Essendon fan and then I went nuts when he kicked that goal and just like lorded it over my dad. And then inexplicably, like less than a week later, I just got bored and switched back to West Coast. But it was a very glorious week that I had as an Essendon fan. Did you win the game at least, um, Andreas, when, the one you attended? As a Carlton supporter. Yeah, did, did yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure the Blues, the Blues won that game. <laughs> I mean, the, the balance of probability back then, because we were awful, was that they did. I don't actually remember. Yeah, fair enough. It's you kind of. Um, it's almost like you guys have kind of ebbed and flowed with Carlton. It's, been, and it's really noticeable because you guys play the opening game every year. Like, there was a period, was it, I think it was like 08, I want to say, the first time you guys started playing that season opener. I could be wrong. Um, and then I think that was when Carlton were starting to get decent under Judd and, you know, Richmond were pretty average. And then, and then obviously it switched in 2010. What was that like? I guess those, I, I think you talk a bit about it with Terry, but like how, how would you contrast like the, your expectations of each round one now? Yeah, we did, did talk about it a bit with Terry. Um, but it's definitely something that has switched completely. It's gone from like optimism leading into it. Or it's like, maybe we'll win. Um, maybe this is the year we win round one. To now expecting to win. Um, and being like, geez, wouldn't it be embarrassing if we lost? <laughs> That's the danger with like rivalry games, for sure. A full reversal, for sure. In yeah. terms of what our expectations have been around one. Around round one. Um, personally, I mean, as a Richmond supporter, it might be a controversial opinion. But I would, would like to see the league go away from that game. Yeah. I think yeah, I think it's something. I think it's something that was good for a while, and it attracted a lot of attention. But maybe needs to be reviewed. I'm not sure if it's if it's necessarily fair that we play the same game every year. And it's been a pretty awful game the last few seasons as well. It might be nice to launch the season on something a bit more competitive. Like reverse reverse Collingwood round two, I think almost traditionally now every year, and that's like. Almost like look forward to that a lot more. Um, obviously, round one just has the whole gravity that it's the return of footy, and that's exciting. Um, but yeah, we also like at the moment we win, but we don't play well as well against Carlton. True. Um, so it's just it's a weird game, a little bit. I would agree. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a weird fixture where. Um... I mean, the AFL, I guess, there's no real incentive for them to put an absolute blockbuster in round one because people are going to go no matter what. So I guess they want to balance it with two teams that will potentially fill out the MCG, but, you know, they want to save their Geelong and Hawthorne or their Richmond Collingwood for, you know, like they want to spread that out over the season, I guess. So that kind of makes sense. Yeah, true. Um, I guess I also now want to sort of deviate into um, that period where things started to turn up for Richmond, and this is uh, probably a bit more happy talking for you guys, but um, when Hardwick took over, my memory is that, and I remember it well because the Eagles won the wooden spoon that year. It was the year Jack Rewalt kicked 10 on us at the MCG. Um, oh, was that game? Oh, yeah, that must have been I wasn't. I was home sick, and I was so dirty. I was so <laughs> dirty when he came home. And yeah. I've been it in. Jack kicked 10, and everyone was going, Jack Rewalt. <laughs> and I was... <laughs> To this day, I, it cuts deep. Ouch, that must suck. Yeah, I uh, my memory is it is because in 2010, I, I used to live overseas. I, I lived in um, Abu Dhabi, so a lot. I used to miss a lot of football back then, and even though I was really obsessed with the Eagles, um, the time zone was not ideal, especially because I used to sleep in as a teenager, uh, and then like I'd have to like follow games on 6 PR or whatever. So this particular game, I do remember. Um, waking up at whatever time and I'd miss the game and Richmond was supposed to be worse than us. This was when I, uh, at the time, I think you guys started 0-9 and like, I remember the conversation was like, are they going to win a game? And obviously that was sensationalist media, but that was where Richmond were at. And then the Eagles, um, you guys flogged Richmond and then, uh, sorry, you guys flogged Port and then, um, yeah, I remember just waking up and checking the score and being like, this is bullshit. No way do we lose to Richmond. But y you guys kind of like emerged as like a half-decent, plucky side almost at the end of Hardwick's first season. At least that's how I remember it. Um, do, how, how well do you think 
Hardwick will stack up in terms of greats at your club, considering how much he's achieved and how much he's turned around this club. Uh, Andres, why don't you answer this one first? <laughs> um, I think he's definitely going to be up there. I, like, if he serves out his contract, which I can't see him not doing, he'll be our longest serving coach by the time he Is eventually right? leaves the club. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I, I can imagine, you know, 30 years from now, he'll be up there with names, names like Tom Hafey and Jack Dyer. Um, just in terms of, of being the person who was finally able to turn the club around. I mean, it, it took him a while, but he, he finally got there in the end. And he's, and he's now coached two premierships um, at Richmond. So, yeah, I think he's definitely going to be very favorably remembered by, by uh, Richmond supporters. And he's also just such a great personality as well. Um, he's bought, you know, as long, along with a lot of football intelligence to the club, he's also bought a lot of like personal development for a lot of the players and, and he's built this like fantastic environment around the club. So it's not just what he's achieved, uh, on field for the team. He's been so great for everyone well, off field as well. And, you know, guys like, like Dustin Martin and, and Marlon Pickett and players who otherwise might've walked away from the game or not got the best potential out of them or all that kind of stuff. He's, he's able to, to connect with those players and create a, an environment in which they can thrive. Um, so I think, yeah, for a lot of that stuff as well, he's been fantastic for our club. And, and that first season, I remember him distinctly, like every press conference, he would say, yes, we lost again, but I don't really care if we win or lose. Like he was more, concerned about the style of football we were playing and about getting games into the players. He just, and he just kept saying like the wins will come, the wins will come. Just be patient, everyone. And, um, and they eventually did eventually finally started to turn. Yeah. Do you, do you want to add anything, Zach? Um, no, I don't think so. I think especially like his name in combination, like kind of the Hardwick and Cochin era that dragged Richmond out of the dumps will kind of be like, um, maybe like cemented into folklore or whatever, Richmond folklore at least. But um. so is that the like the fan perception? That it's kind of hard we can coach in terms of, I guess, from a cultural standpoint, have really lifted the club. Because I, I mean, you had Dusty for a while, but then it seems like he, like he didn't really have his head screwed on. Maybe I'm not too sure. Maybe your perspective is different. But like, it was only like before 2017 or 16, he was regarded as a really exciting player with a lot of potential, but it was never really considered one of the best. It's almost like, it was almost like, like he seemed like another Dugowie, like a, a really good sort of impact player, but never was going to, you know, potentially win multiple brown lows. Um, do you, would you sort of say like they were sort of instrumental in turning him around or what's, what's your perspective? Um, well, I know like in the 2017 grand final doco, like they don't believe in never, I love that, actually. Yeah, I absolutely love it. Even the Eagles one as well, they did, I think, even a, a better job of the next year. Um, oh, really? I remember the, uh, my favourite bit of the Richmond one is at the end where Hardwick's like, did Dusty cry or something like that? And then it just pans out on his face. I just love like the West Coast one, how they tell the story through that final play. Yeah. Um, I think that's really good storytelling. Um, but there's a quote, I think Hardwick says, no one's had a greater effect on our number four than our number nine and he talks about um kind of the impact of Trent on Dusty and I think Koch has said like in the past that um Dusty's like the first person he'd call to babysit his kids and stuff and uh, that's so bizarre I think like yeah. his I think uh Koch's kids call him like Uncle Usty kind of thing <laughs> um and stuff like that so yeah I think he's they've on the from the outside looking in, um, I guess Koch has always been there for Dusty and kind of like made him with, uh, I don't know, part of his family or whatever. And um, that's just like it, giving him a nice stable off field and that's maybe helped him be more consistent on field when he can just go out and play football. For sure. It seems like I, I feel like you almost couldn't contrast two blokes more than Dusty and Koch and it's it just seems like in terms of personality like Koch is extremely intelligent and articulate as well and you, when Dusty talks it's sometimes like a little bit hard <laughs> to, to like get all the way to the end of the sentence it almost seems like that which is a little bit rude but obviously he's a gun um so yeah I guess yeah like you were sort of alluding to before it's almost like Koch has that intangibility 
that's kind of added to the squad um, more so than necessarily his disposal average per game. So I guess he, he, as well, he'll be regarded as one of Richmond's greats, like you were sort of saying. Mm. It was incredible in the 2017 final series as well. Um, we, I mean, we can debate until the cows come home whether he should have played in that grand final or not. Oh, yeah, true. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, you guys won by so much, it doesn't matter. Yeah, throughout that whole final series, he was incredible. At the game against Geelong, he was phenomenal um, and really set the tone against GWS as well. So I think, yeah, a lot of that down to him. Um, Dusty is, is a character as well that I think just doesn't really like the spotlight as much. Mm. Um, from everything you sort of gather, like behind closed doors at the football club, he's you know quite chatty and personable and gets on really well with everyone, but has a lot of issues with the media, I think. Sure. A lot of that, I think, is he feels a bit resentful about how the media have portrayed him in the past as well. Um, you know, like uh, focusing a lot on his dad and, and the whole thing that happened with the, the chopstick. And yeah. Stuff. Yeah. A couple of years back as well. I think he, he resents the media a lot from that and, and almost goes out of his way to avoid them. Yeah. Okay. I want to ask you guys, I know you're Richmond fans, so um, you've obviously got a bit of an inclination on this question, but you're also very... Um, looking at your channel as well, you're very non-biased, you're very neutral. I want to ask, in your opinion, who is the best player in the game? Um, That's a good question. It's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if the quest, if it's ever been tougher to answer than this mm. at the moment. The likes of Danger, Dusty, Fife, because um, they're all very different players as well. And then, like, you throw Ruckman into the mix as well, and it's just a whole yeah. different ball game. Um, yeah. I uh, know, kind of like if I like if I have to say one, I almost take the easy option out at the moment and say Fife because he's got the brown low, um, and he's he's also at the worst club out of everyone that kind of Very gets true. up there, I think. Um, and like the ability for him to just throw Fremantle on his back and potentially drag them over the line, and then you have someone like Michael Walt- Walters who just finish everything off and. Like, that's what has to happen sometimes for them to win, and he can do it, I think, is pretty impressive. Um, but, like, watching Dusty week in and week out, when he's on, like, it's amazing, but I definitely think, like, consistency. I would say he's the best big game player out of everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, like, when he has to turn it on, then he's the most damaging. But I would say five at the moment. Good answer. Uh, what about you, Andreas? Uh, yeah, I agree with a lot of what Zach said. Um, I think Dusty was definitely the best player in the competition two, two three years ago, so 2017. I would have, yep. would have said here yeah, in a heartbeat. Yeah, 17 for sure. Um, if, if I was building a team from scratch, I think my number one draft pick would, would be Paddy Cripps. Mm. I think he's just such a dynamic player and he brings so much to that Carlton team and similar to what Zach was saying about Fife as well um, where he's been in a bad team for a long time and still managed to excel um, but I think he's yeah an, an incredible player and so physically gifted as well to be a, a midfielder and be as tall as he is and built like he is mm-hmm. he's just very 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 hard to stop he's like um, one and, five. it's crazy yeah and and will only get better his best football is, is ahead of him. Um, I'm a huge fan of Tom Mitchell as well. Yeah, right. When, when Zach was talking about um, the, the videos, the, the scripts that we were writing to kind of get the channel started, um, the Gold Coast GWS video was the first script I wrote, but I was also working on a, a Tom Mitchell script for a long time as well, um, which was ended up being one of the first videos we released. And, and going back and watching it now, like it does, and seeing how far we come for that first video. We were so proud videos, of it. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no, it was a great video. I remember exactly the video you're talking about. But I... Oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, I just, just got sick of all the media commentary around him um, and around people trying to say he's not that good. I, I'm a little bit guilty of that. Yeah, reject that notion out of hand. Fair enough. So he's kind of like one player outside of Richmond that I do have a real sweet spot for. Yeah, okay, interesting. I like it. It's funny, uh, It's uh, the points you make about Fife and Cripps playing at weaker clubs, it would be very, very interesting if you threw either of them at Geelong or Richmond. 
um, and to see exactly the impact they had. I think one player, like, this is just my preference, but I, I, for me, there's almost like this intangible, uh, or maybe it's not actually intangible, but like um, the element of when this player gets the ball, do you go, oh, shit? <laughs> and I feel like Dusty is probably the biggest example of that. Whenever Richmond gets the, uh, sorry, has possession and sort of Dusty gets the ball five meters in the clear, that's when you're like, oh god, this is going to be a goal, and I feel like, um, and Dangerfield for that as well as me, and that's why I've kind of always favoured them. But I like to answer my own question. I think, uh, like, I'm going to sit on the fence. I think between Dusty Danger and Fife, and I said it in my video, I can't really split them, and it's almost like they they ebb and flow based on their form is who you have in front. Um, and I ended the year saying Danger was the best player, and then Fife won the Brownlow in an absolute canter. So you know, <laughs> that's just the way it goes sometimes. Um, I also want to ask a little bit, so with Richmond um, and their sort of uprising through that mid 2010s period, um, I think you guys made the finals in 14, 15, 16 and lost, um, lost in, well, you lost all three in the first week, didn't you, and got eliminated and then obviously missed the finals after that. What was your, what was the sort of vibe among supporters at the time? Because I, like on the one hand, you're like, okay, we've made finals four years after being, you know, terrible. Um, but did you sort of lose faith in the regime at the time? And obviously, 2016 was a real down year. What was it like as Richmond fans uh, and your perception of, of Hardwick, et cetera, at the time? Yeah, it was, it was 13, 14, 15, I think. We got bundled out. Oh, sorry, my mistake. It was. Bundled out of elimination finals. Um, the Carlton one, I think, hurt the most. Because obviously Carlton yep. finished, we, we finished fifth that year. Carlton finished ninth. Yeah. Um, so shouldn't have even been in the finals. And then. Well, North Melbourne was a similar deal, wasn't it, in 15? North Melbourne was a weird one because we played them two weeks in a row. Yes. So um, they rested we, about half their team. Yeah. yeah right. right. There was no way they could finish. I think they were guaranteed to finish either seventh or eighth. Yeah. Yep. So they, they rested half their team. Um, we beat them pretty easily in round 23 and then came out and they beat us. Mm. Horrible umpiring decision in, in the forward pocket that punt ran into the ground uh, that, that arguably cost us the game, but we don't need to talk about that. Yeah, you clearly let that go. Uh, <laughs> I have not let that go. It's well it behind us. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, those first... I can't even remember now who was first out of. I think it went, went Carlton North and then Port Adelaide. But I could be wrong about that. I think it was uh, Port was fourteen. Port Port North. was fourteen. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was that dodgy uh, coin toss decision. Was it? Was it Cochin that pointed the wrong? Oh, chose the wrong end. Yeah. yeah. Cochin kicked into the wind. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and we just about took the game off at quarter time. <laughs> yeah. 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 We almost went. Um, really, Dad and I were yeah. We were talking about driving to Adelaide to the game. I think Twisty Three did that. Um, the the YouTuber I had on the pod a few weeks ago, he said he drove to that game. I'm very glad that we didn't go. Yeah, wow. But that that year was kind of a write off because we started so far back and we had to win. I think it was nine games in a row. Yeah, end of that season to even make the finals. So we'd been playing elimination finals for weeks. Yeah. And that last game against Sydney where we went up to Sydney and, and Rance had a fantastic duel with Buddy and Dustin Martin kicks the last goal to seal the game right at the end. Um, I think winning yeah. that game was enough that year. Yeah, yeah fair enough. It didn't matter all that much. Um, but then the one against North definitely stung. Like there was a, a game we should have won, a team we should have beaten. Uh, and then it was three in a row. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but I guess what was what were your feelings about because like as football fans we sort of our expectations rise quickly you know like you know, even to the Eagles like after I think we're zero and one the year after winning the flag and it's like Sack Simpson <laughs> um, but so it's like what uh, what was it like with Hardwick did you sort of never lose the faith or I guess I'm really talking about 2016 in particular um, was there a period where you're like uh, we might need a change. I think it definitely kind of starts to play on your mind. Um, it was just like, it was probably a little bit harsh almost as well that like the three years all culminated um, into then having a disappointing 2016 
It's like mm. that was all ammo ready to go pointed at Hardwick. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Richmond fans just being so cynical. Um, like I think mm. – so I would mean 16, I don't know. I like I wasn't super like sack him or anything, but I don't think I would have asked any questions if he had a been. Um, I think, I don't know, from memory, Dad was pretty critical of him um, in 16. And just everyone was, I think. And I was, I'd probably, looking back, I'm almost surprised that he didn't get sacked just on the back of, um, bad press from Richmond fans, but mm. I think mm. probably credit to people like Peggy O'Neill um, and Brendan Gale, who you know kind of had a plan and were happy to stick to it. Yeah, I think them them stepping in and, and Brendan Gale in particular, like being completely behind Hardwick, really helped him. I I think similar to Zach, like I I was was more than happy for Hardwick to be given more time. Um, Another another season or two for sure. I would like I think could see like where he was going with the players and the team that he had at his disposal. But had he been sacked, I don't think I would have been sad about it. I would have would have said okay, like I can see the rationale behind that decision. Um, yeah, very glad that very glad that he wasn't. But yeah, we just played yeah. awful football that year. We terrible like terrible brand of football. No one at the club seemed happy, um, and they they did. They did do a fair clear out. I think pretty much all of our assistant coaches um, left that season as well, and they did a big clean out of the football department. So even though Hardwick remained, there was definitely still a lot of fresh ideas coming into the club, and I think that was a really good thing. Yeah, I think um, Justin Lepich had just been to Brisbane, and then he came back after 2016 as well, um, Mm. who's probably a bit of an underrated assistant coach. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. I, um, I, yeah, I'm kind of an ad- advocate for giving coaches more time than what it seems like the consensus is in the AFL community uh, or in the Premier League. If you follow the Premier League, you guys said you follow, yeah. Who, who do you spot in the Premier League? Just as a little aside. You love Everton. <laughs> Everton. Oh baby. I'm a Liverpool fan. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, I was just going to say like, oh, Claudio Ranieri, like the example of the worst probable sacking in, in my opinion. But, um, but I mean, like, Damien Hardwick is probably the best example of why you, you shouldn't sack someone after a bad year. And another example is Dame, uh, sorry, uh, Nathan Buckley, someone who perennially un- underperformed as Collingwood coach. I know they had injuries, but by m- at most clubs, I actually think he would have been sacked well before, um, you know, Collingwood emerged and then, you know, made the grand final and now a premiership contender. So, um, yeah, I think that's almost like a little sort of... Um, yeah, what's the word? It's just a sort of like cautionary tale against against clubs sacking them. Um, so in 2017, right, you, you guys started the season well. You, I think you went 4-0, and oh, then 4-5. and five. I think you won 4 and lost 5 or something. Maybe it was the other way around, 5-4. and four. Um, So, I mean, we were looking at halfway through the season, similar to 2019. It didn't look like you were going to win the flag from there. So I'm curious as to when you guys started to believe you could win the flag. I think um, it's kind of interesting. There was that game against GWS where Jeremy Cameron kicked the goal right on the siren. And that was where, that was the moment where um, I was kind of like, oh no, it's like, it's all falling apart. There go the wheels. Um, and I think for me, when I kind of started believing again was when we beat GWS later in the season at the MCG. Um, I presume you don't mean the prelim. No. <laughs> during the, we burst them twice during the home and away. Um, yeah. I think probably a few rounds before the end of the season. And I was that was kind of like, okay, we are actually good. Um, and then at that stage, like, I don't, I think Andreas is probably the same. Premiership was like never even in my mind until we made oh. the grand final. Like, really? For the final final against Geelong, I was just like, like if we just win a final, that's like that's going to be enough for me this year. Wow! Because like we, when we're talking about like the kind of Wallace years and everything, I was more at like that impressionable age when we lost the three finals in a row, and that was just like such a huge um, mm. impact on like me as a kid. And I was like, I just want to win one, and I was so glad that if even if we lost, we'd have a second chance to hopefully try and 
win again. <laughs> yeah. Um, and each week it was just like, oh, how cool would it be if we made a prelim? It was like kind of in the back of my mind. And then how cool would it be if we made the grand final? But I wouldn't have been shattered if we had beaten Geelong or lost in an, in an uh, semi final or anything, even as well. It's a bit strange, but. That's interesting. What about you, Andreas? Yeah, very, very similar to Zach. Um, I had a really interesting year in 2017 for a whole heap of reasons, but um, I was actually overseas for the first half of the year. So I went and and did an exchange and I was living in Denmark um, up until July. So I, yeah, kind of had this weird thing where I was watching this really strange rise happen from afar. And I was, you know, in lectures streaming games of, of footy on my laptop and I remember like literally walking around this palace in Denmark, listening to the uh, the Richmond Bulldogs game on the radio through the AFL app. Um, and it's, yeah, having all, all these weird moments like that. So I think I definitely didn't start believing until I came home and was kind of like surrounded by it a little bit more. Um, but yeah, same as Zach, like I just wanted to beat Geelong or at least just win one final. And we, we worked out of the game at, at the, the MCG. And I think I literally like turned to, to everyone else and said, I don't care what happens now. Like, I'm just, I'm just happy we won oh, at least cool. one final. Um, yeah. And Geelong as well, we hadn't beat it in years. I don't think I'd be, yeah. I don't think I'd even seen us ever beat Geelong. I don't know. In my lifetime. I'm not well, sure. Well, they were the team that, they were the team that inflicted like 157 points on you in 07. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> Sorry to just bring that up. <laughs> just a little bit of uh, <laughs> Richmond trivia there. Yeah, no, but I mean, you're, not, you're far from the only club that Geelong has absolutely annihilated. So um, I would imagine that a few teams have good feel good stories about beating Geelong for the first time in a while. My my perception at the time was, um, you know, in 17 that Adelaide and Geelong were clearly the best two teams going into the final. So Richmond was almost like that dark horse or even realistically, and I was wrong, I wasn't even considering Richmond until they annihilated Geelong. I mean, they must, what was it, like 10 goals? You guys would probably ever tell me. It was, I feel like it was around 10 goals. Um, that I don't think it was them. that much. But oh, wasn't it? First half. It was like there was only It was a, a low-scoring game. Really? Okay. I, I felt like, um, well, from my perception anyway, it was just like, my mind completely changed. I was like, oh, I reckon Richmond's going to win the flag here. Um, and they're like the biggest challenger was Adelaide who obviously didn't, um, didn't really turn up on grand final day. But I guess like as well, I want to ask what that feeling was like when you guys did beat Adelaide in the grand final. Um, did you guys attend? No. Unfortunately not. No, we were at the live site at Punt Road. Just, yep. just next door. <laughs> Yeah, nice. No, that's still pretty good. Uh, so what, what was it like, though, um, you know, the combination of, Andreas, especially for you going through that, you know, however, oh, yeah, 16 years since you'd won a final off the top of my head. Um, what was that feeling like for you, both of you? Very cathartic, I think. Yeah. It's like a, a immense sense of relief. Um, and because we, it, was, it was interesting as well because we pretty much had the game wrap up most of the second half. So it was kind of just this wave of just like enjoying it throughout the, mm. especially the last quarter of the games. Like every moment um, was definitely one of the best experiences I think I've ever had watching a game of footy because you just were, was enjoying everything so much. Um, it was it was great because we had a whole family there as well. Like we're all at mm. Punt Road. Even mum came who is actually a Hawthorne supporter, but not oh, really? super into footy. She's secretly um, a Richmond supporter. <laughs> <laughs> she came along with us so it was it was all five of us there and then and it, it had been a tough few months for our family for various reasons as well so i think it felt extra special because of that that's nice what about you zach similar sort of sentiment yeah i think just the atmosphere at the live site um was pretty nice because it was just richmond and it was like everyone who's just been in the same boat as you yeah. um who like weren't fortunate enough to be in the ground but just you know, wanted to be as close as possible to the action or the same, um, which is really cool atmosphere. Like we we're still doing like, you know, full on chants and everything um, as well. But yeah, just like, uh, I think we like all five of us, um, it's like brothers and parents, like all just embraced um, when the siren went and it was just like a nice moment. It was like, 
everything that we'd been through had like built up to that kind of moment of success we were just able to I don't know have a breath of fresh air and be like it was all worth it yeah you felt vindicated I think because they you know you, you definitely had those moments over the years where you're like oh should I change teams should I stop paying so much attention to footy like should I focus on other things in my life kind of stuff and we've all been there time yeah all those moments of like those you know moments along the way where you chose to stick with the tigers those decisions all felt like they were worthwhile. They were vindicated mm. on that on that one day. Yeah, all those Monday mornings at school where you just copped it, it was like... <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that story. And I have a very similar sort of feeling about the Eagles um, who, like I said before, have been pretty successful. So I'm by no means a hard done by supporter, but I went through that dip um, at sort of that teenage age and the, the emotion of it, of it all like culminating in that, that premiership win was amazing. It's interesting. Um, uh, it's, it's, I guess you still had a really enjoyable grand final day experience. Obviously my 2018 experience was obviously the Eagles were five goals down <laughs> before we even really adjusted ourselves in our seats. Um, so that was probably one of the most uncomfortable games I've ever attended. Um, other than the last, the Dom Sheed goal was like probably the best moment of my life. But up until that moment, I don't think I even like breathed a word. But I contrasted as well with um, with the prelim. And I totally know what you mean where, uh, where we played Melbourne. And I think we kicked the first 10 goals to nothing at halftime. And every single goal was a party. Um, like, and, you know, Elta Stadium was about 99.5% Eagles fans. Um, and I'd imagine that day, grand, uh, that grand final for you guys, uh, obviously at Punt Road, um, yeah, mostly it's everyone was sort of getting around the same team. That must have been a pretty amazing experience. How would you contrast this as an, um, I want to ask this as an Eagles fan. So Richmond, obviously, were kind of underdogs in 2017. And, and the Eagles, um, maybe to a lesser extent, were certainly not like raging favorites or anything. But I've often wondered what it would be like to um, to win a flag again um, as um, two years after, let's say, like let's say the Eagles won in twenty twenty. How that would contrast winning the first one when we weren't necessarily expected to. So I'm, I'm, what I'm asking is, what was twenty nineteen like in terms of emotion? Was it different? Um, how would you describe it, Andreas? First, I guess. Um, it was different because we were there that time. Yeah, okay. That, that was great. Uh, we did manage to get tickets to the Giants game. Yep. Um, and, and I definitely, I remember distinctly barracking for GWS against Collingwood in that prelim because <laughs> if the Giants won, it was very likely we'd then get tickets to the game. Whereas if Collingwood right. won, it was going to be the hardest thing in the history of the world probably to get tickets to a Richmond-Collingwood grand final. Good point. Um, but yeah, it was, it was great to be there and be part of it all as well. Um, obviously an awful game of footy from a neutral perspective, but we just had so much fun that day. Um, so much. Being, yeah, we were behind the goals of the partner at end. So we were, we were in amongst it all, um, could see all the action happening and we were out, you know, on Swan street after the game as well. So I think we felt a bit more involved as fans in 2019. Mm. Um, and that I think possibly meant that I enjoyed it. Maybe almost as my, about the same as 2017, like enjoyed them for different reasons. Um, I think the team deserved another premiership as well. Like who's no, who knows what's going to happen now? I think this season is now just the, the hardest thing to, to predict because of everything that's happened around it. But I think it would have been unfair to the team that we had, had we only ended up winning the one premiership from that, from that era. So I'm glad we got the second, the second final as well. What about you, Zach? Yeah, I almost um, I kind of agree with it's what Andreas was saying that I probably um, am more proud of the 2019 Premiership in terms of where we were at the start of the season because it was like 2018, it's like, okay, Richmond have got to bounce back um, and then everything just fell apart. Um, like Rance goes down in round one, Jack the next week. I think Koch had hammy issues all year. Um, and I think Tom Tom Lynch and Dion Prestia were the only players to play every single game for us in the home and away season. Mm. Um, and I think we used like second amount of players all up. So it was like the road to get back to the grand final and have that chance again just made it 
um, very sweet, I think, and just because of how much of a surprise 2017 was as well. It was like that came out of nowhere. Um, so what I would say is probably when the final siren went, that kind of moment of happiness um, was probably greater in 2017, but 2019 was like, I don't know, I kind of think is almost more triumphant. Oh, that's an interesting answer. I like that. Yeah, my um, I wouldn't say criticism of Richmond, but I, my sort of question mark that I kind of peddled during um, 2017 and 18, I guess, was Richmond had never had the same... Oh, they, I, I felt like their adversity, there wasn't as much adversity on them in terms of like their injury run in 2018. I think they had, I mean, you, you can talk about the fixture or whatever. I don't really buy into that necessarily. But um, the point being in 2018, they sort of almost glided to it and then fell over the last hurdle. And then in 2019, it was almost the opposite. It was, all, it was like all the adversity you could have faced in the previous two years hit you all at once. Rance does his ACL. As you say, Cochin um, does his hammy. Um, and it just seemed like the ultimate test um, for Richmond to overcome. So I agree. The, I think the fact that they've recovered from that period uh, to win the flag is a crazy achievement and it really does entrench them as probably one of the one of the better teams in the modern era. Obviously, you've got Geelong and Hawthorne to compete with there. You're probably a premiership short around really being in that conversation. But I agree with what uh, Andrea said as well. You um, That... Uh, I think it was Andre said it. Sorry, I'm getting confused for a second. But what you said you yeah. you deserve that second premiership, like that the playing group. Yeah, yeah that was yeah, cool. Um, <laughs> I also, want to ask you. I kind of skipped over it, but what was the feeling you had in 2018, and how do you reflect on that now? I mean, uh, it's a dumb question. Obviously, you would have been shattered after losing that prelim, um, and you would have been shell shocked. But I guess now that you won 2019, have you been able to let that go? I think definitely now. Um, yeah. I was a bit of a crybaby on the night, I think. Like, I was, just was like, so mad at me. I was so confident um, at everything. And, like, um, I think we said on Blue Broad as well that both of our girlfriends go for Collingwood. Oh, um, really? I didn't yeah. Even so that's, that's the other thing that, like, with last year's prelim, I was so terrified that it would be Richmond Collingwood because I didn't want that adversity. Yeah. Grand final. Um, and I think, like, so, um, like, Jazz and I, like, we're super close, always, um, like, texting or whatever, and we were texting during the game. And when Collingwood got on a roll, I just, like, stopped replying. Um, just, like, had a huge tantrum for the rest of the night. And then I think a couple of hours later, I just texted there, like, you guys just completely outplayed us, like down like good luck for the grand final and everything um so were you I'm, able to support collingwood the following week or so i watched with her family so right. like i would have loved to see them you know like experience what i did the year before mm -hmm. i mean they're not the biggest footy fans in the world and they'll admit that um, and i've sort of definitely helped kind of like grow their footy interest stuff. but yeah i definitely felt for them uh, when collingwood didn't get up as well yeah, fair enough. What about you, Andres? How do you reflect on 2018? Um, I, yeah, I definitely agree with what you said at the start, that, that I have been able to let it go after, after the success of last year. But at the time, um, I was quite, quite salty. I had an, an irrational hatred of Mason Cox. Oh, everyone does. That's not irrational at all. <laughs> um, for the next year after that, literally any time he said anything, I'd just be like, shut up. Yeah. yeah. Get off. Get off, my, get off my Facebook, <laughs> get off my TV. Yeah. Just have like flash, I'd be, be like lying in bed and I'd have like images of Mason Cox taking contested marks, just like <laughs> flashing my brain. Um, oh, I was, no. was pretty upset as well because I managed to get tickets to that game at the last minute. Oh, okay. We weren't going to go and then I found two tickets. So my dad and I went, we were pretty excited and then it just ended up being a complete waste of time and money. How do you almost, how do you describe what happened? Like, did Richmond just all get the flu? Like, what happened? Because I, I reckon that happens more than you think in footy. Like, you know, when it, some team just gets inexplicably belted? Like, um, there must be, like, if, if well, a team Adelaide gets sick. Well, on the final day in, in 2017 is, yeah. Yeah, is another classic example of us. Like, I'll, I'll readily admit the Crows were a better team than us all year. Um, I think we probably played a better final series than they did overall. But as far as, you know, form during the season goes, the Crows... Um, yeah. Were, were the team to beat and just didn't turn up on grand final day. 
Mm. Yeah, you could just have days like that as a football team, I think, where it doesn't click. Um, mm. I think because football is t- such a team game as well, it's like when things start going poorly, it can almost snowball in a way. Like if a couple of players are off, then that then has like a linking on effect that the rest of the team then, then is off. And if the coach is off, then it, it all kind of goes through. Whereas the opposite can definitely happen as well. Like if, if things are going badly and then all of a sudden one player turns it on, it can lift the rest of the team. But we just didn't have that. Like no one sparked. We had mm-hmm. moments in that game where we almost got back into it. Like we'd, we'd, you know, kick two goals in a row or something like that. And then someone would be having a set shot. I think Jack Rewalt missed a couple of, you know, set shots that he'd kick any other day. Yeah. That would have given us the chance to, to build. And it's like all those dominoes just kept toppling and we just couldn't get into the game at all. Um, mm. It's interesting what you say. Or something, Jack. So, yeah. Sorry, no, what were you saying? No, I was just saying, I think Jack kicked like 5 2 or something in that game. It was right. Like, yeah. It was like it was kept probably... us in it, but. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, true. Um, it's interesting what you say about like how it's just kind of a little tangent here, but um, it's funny how when you're saying like, um, yeah, you know, when a couple of players drop their heads, you know, it has that ripple effect. It's funny watching that um, Don't Believe in Never with the Eagles one. Uh, one thing I found funny is if. I, oh, it might it actually it might not be that video. It's a different video, but basically, like you got guys like McGovern and Kennedy being interviewed, and they're like, "Yeah, that point, mate. I thought we were fucked. Like I was, we were. It was going to be like 2015 again." And then like Lucia was like, "Yeah, you could really tell the boys were still up and about, like despite being five goals <laughs> down." And I was like, "There's clearly like no synergy there." Uh, so it's just a little funny observation there. Um, but yeah. Anyway, like I like you said, like Richmond have kind of overcome 2018 and. Um, kind of entrenched themselves, like I said, in that conversation as being a genuinely great team. So, um, I mean, eighteen and four in twenty eighteen is such a such a good. Uh, you were two games clear on top, and it will always be like one that got away. But um, you know, two out of three ain't bad. And potentially going forward, there might be another one. I guess one final Richmond question I want to ask you though is, as far as I'm concerned, I feel like Richmond is still. Obviously, there's uncertainty with the, the future of the league and, and stuff, but all things being equal, I feel like Richmond are well-placed to be there for another couple of years at least in that conversation. What do you think is the – who or yeah, who or what do you think is the biggest threat to this Richmond dynasty going, you know, another step? I'm not, I'm not saying West Coast. Like, I'm not, not like, teeing that up. I just – genuine question. Like, hey, Martin, answer you want us to say here, <laughs> No, you can say age if you want, but yeah. Um, the coronavirus is, is the biggest. <laughs> the answer True. happened to rhyme with East Toast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was more angling it. I think GWS and their list potential probably is one of the biggest threats to Richmond. Obviously, they're going to start winning at the MZG. Um, that and the fact that, you know, just aging stars retiring, like you lost Rance. Um, not that that really affected you last year. Um, you know, Jack Rewalt, Cochin's a little bit older. But other than that, I still think you guys have got the legs for a little bit further. Is that how you guys feel? Yeah, a little bit. I think, like, in terms of if a grand final was played, like, here and now, then Collingwood is a big threat as well. Um, like, mm. we've talked a lot. They never really were at their best last season. But I think they're kind of racing against the clock now a little bit more to get a premiership under Buckley. Um so definitely the Giants and the, and West Coast is, I would agree, are like two very much long term threats and current threats as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, like we've been reluctant to use Dynasty um, yet. Yeah, like we still think we're a Premiership or two away. But yeah, what do you reckon? Yeah, like we're we're definitely nowhere near say the Hawthorne of the of the mid the middle of the decade i think like one more premiership and then maybe we could start talking about the, the teams in the same kind of conversation um but yeah right now i think west both west coast west coast and gws um for the next few years i see as us having a lot of games a lot of good games against um it's kind of been fun in a way we've been able to build up a little bit of a rivalry with the giants we've had a lot of really close games against them now um mm. And that's been it's been good because I think now I think of them as more of a team in my head. Mm. Um, they're like a team that might beat us, and you know I feel a bit of animosity towards certain players that that play for them now. 
won't name any names, but I'm sure we can all take some guesses. <laughs> um, so I think that's been fun. Like, as I feel like they're kind of more incorporated in the competition in my head now, where someone like the Gold Coast, I still see as like a new team because they've never had that. Yeah. Like, yeah, the Giants, is, if anyone's going to have a dynasty in the next decade, I see them as the number one contender for sure. Um, West Coast have a great team at the moment. And and we talked a bit about this on our channel as well, um, in that we don't even think the Eagles need to be that stressed about winning at the moment. You know, you just brought Tim Kelly in. A few of your players, guys, maybe like Kennedy, I think, is the only one who's maybe looking at wrapping up soon. So you've got a few years there where you can let the team gel together again and, and push for another premiership. Um, so I think that's a scary prospect as well. Whereas teams like like Collingwood and Geelong, I think, are maybe have another year or two and then might start to drop away again. Yeah, fair enough. I agree. I, I'm sort of comfortable with, with the list demographic of the Eagles. Yeah, Collingwood's an interesting one. I feel like they do have a lot of players in their prime still, but one player that just like they're just not going to be able to replace is Scott Pendlebury. And he's like, what, 32? Maybe he's a bit younger than that. But either way, like, I know he's playing really well, but he's going to be one player that, um, you know, that I, I feel like they've got to win one while he's there. Um, otherwise, it's going to be very tough. But um, anyway, boys, we're just about ready to wrap up the podcast. We've gone a little bit over time, but that's all right. I've had a great time chatting to you lads. As a way to sign off, though, uh, why don't you guys tell um, you know the listeners and the viewers on YouTube where they can find you and your social medias, etc. Mm-hmm. I'll let our, our social media manager handle this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, on YouTube, you just look up Booty A to Z. Um, with the number two and we're pretty much on most social media just um instagram i think there's just an underscore in in between um yeah so find us there that's it. I will, of course, put the links uh, to all your uh, to your channel and all that to, in the description of this video, guys. Uh, and for those listening, I 100% advocate you check them out because they're doing stuff that no one else in this space is doing. Super informative. I regularly learn stuff from this channel. They've got videos about who owns the AFL clubs, you know, the history of state of origin and plenty more than that. Lads, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Jesse. It's been great. Thank fun. you very much.